Okay, today solving polynomial inequalities. Yesterday was linear inequalities, and uh, the difficulty level really ramps up here. I'll show you two different ways to handle it and lots of different examples so that you get a really good feel for it. So we now extend our attention to a type of question that is only one more giant, one more step. Oh, what an understatement. Let me just add a word in there for you so you don't feel weird when you get to this homework. One more giant step in difficulty. It says example, solve x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 4 greater than 0. Now we have a lot of the weapons we need. We know what solving inequalities that will get lots of different x values for our answer from, from the last section, solving linear inequalities. And we know how to deal with polynomials as far as factoring them. Now, the first example, as a warm-up, I've made a factored one. And we'll talk about how to do it once it's factored. Then we'll go back and talk about ones that have to be factored, and hopefully your factoring skills come back from the last chapter. So... There are a few things we know about this right off the hop. If we want to know where x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 4 is greater than 0, it's going to be very helpful to know where it equals 0. That will help make our decision, and you'll see why in just a minute. So our first move in solving polynomial inequalities is to sort of pretend that's an equal sign in there, and then get that information, find out when it's equal to 0, and we'll use that in our answer. Now, the next one is the only place that this function, x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 4, can change signs is at the zeros. So when we're looking for where it might go from positive to negative, we only have to look at the zeros. That's the only time it can change from positive to negative. Think about that for a second. A function, if it's positive, the only way it can get down to being negative is to pass through zero if it's continuous. Now, we're not going to talk about that too much if it's continuous to later chapters. But you might think, oh, what if it jumps over? Okay, all the functions we're talking about in this chapter, because they're polynomials, are continuous. So the only way to get from positive to negative is to go through the zero. And the last point, from chapter three, we know how to find out when this thing equals zero. Especially this one, it's factored. If they're not factored, we'll have to do some factoring. So let's find out where the function we're talking about, x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 4, is equal to 0. We just look at each of the functions, or each of the factors. x could equal negative 3, or x could equal 1, or x could equal 4. Hopefully that's old news. Hopefully you look at that and go, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then let's look at a picture of what we found out. We know that there has to be a 0 at x equals negative 3. I'm going to just highlight that in red. We know there is a 0 at x equals 1, and we know there's a 0 at x equals 4. So we're only really concerned about these four intervals. And in fact, I can answer the question right here. I can just make a graph of it and say, okay, what's going on here? We're talking about a cubic because there's three factors and each of the x values is positive. So its leading coefficient would be positive. This is all skills from last chapter. So we know the end behavior as x goes to infinity y will go to infinity, and as x goes to negative infinity, y would go to negative infinity. No bounces or bends to worry about, no double zeros. So when I draw this graph, it, the shape looks something like this. I don't know exactly where these max mins are or exactly how fast it goes down. Uh, so I know the basic shape, but I don't know exactly where all these zeros are. But that's not what I need for the question. What I need for the question is, remember what it was asking? It was asking, when is this thing greater than zero? And I can look right at my graph and see when it's greater than zero. Here comes the highlight. It's greater than zero in here. And it's greater than zero in here. And actually, that's all there is to the questions. It's just to find those sections, and I can answer the question right here. When is it greater than zero? Uh, between negative 3 and 1. And when x is greater than 4. Done. So you can just do this by graphing. And you, if you want to do the questions in this section by graphing, go right ahead. I encourage you to think about building a chart for them. Not for the difficulty of these questions, but moving forward, these charts will be invaluable as we go into Chapter 5 and as we go into Calculus. So I want you to take a look at these charts. When you're first doing the homework, if you're having trouble, just build a graph. Great. But if you want to be able to be ready for what is coming next, move over to building towards the charts. And what I mean by a chart is, let me just do this question that I've done. I'm done. Answer, done. Right there. Let me just do it another way that will get you more ready for other chapters. Uh, 
we're only concerned with what x plus 3, x minus 1, x minus 4 does in four intervals. And here's the four intervals, x less than th negative 3. So in this section here, between, let's go to a different color highlighter here. Over here, I, I want to know what is the function doing when x is less than negative 3. We found out it was negative. We want to know what it's doing between negative 3 and 1. That's in here. And we found out it was positive when we built our graph. We want to know between 1 and 4 in there. And we want to know for x greater than 4. So that's where those four intervals come from. They come from those zeros. We want to know, is it positive or negative in each of these four intervals? So what we do is we can build a little chart here. And I'll, I'll show you how to build these charts a little faster as we go along. But what I do is I build a chart and I go, okay, well, what's happening in these four intervals that I identified? And I just plug some numbers in and test out what it's doing. So I plug in negative 4, 0, 2 and 5. And the reason I've chosen those numbers is that's a representative in each of these sections. I want to know what's going on for less than negative 3, so I plug in negative 4. I want to know what's going on between negative 3 and 1, so I plug in 0. And I want to plug, know what's going on between 1 and 4, so I plug in 2. And I want to know what's going on after 4, and so I plug in 5. So I just picked a representative number. There's lots of good choices to find out whether it's positive or negative in each of those sections. Now, you might think that's more difficult and more work. And it is for the questions in this chapter. So again, as you're zipping through the homework, only try these charts once in a while so you're clear on what's going on. Now, what's the advantage of the chart? This actually could be done a much faster way. Take a look at this. If I was using negative 4 as my representative number right there, I don't have to sub it in and find out that the answer was negative 40. All I got to do is look at the factors. Negative 4, when I put it into the first factor, x plus 3, becomes negative. Negative 4, when I plug it into x minus 1, is negative. And negative 4, when I plug it into x minus 4, is also negative. I just look at the factors and see what happens as I sub into each factor. And I get three negatives. And negative times negative times negative is negative. Now, you may think that's a lot of work. And it is a lot of work for these particular questions. You don't have to do them that way. But it's good practice for what's coming next. I'm telling you, for Chapter 5 and for Calculus, those these skills are very viable. A little easier when you're using 0, so I'm thinking about what happens when I put into 0 into x plus 3, I get positive. What happens when I put 0 into x minus 1, I get negative. And what happens when I put 0 into x minus 4, I get negative. And positive times negative times negative will be positive. Uh, a number between 1 and 4, I chose 2. Uh, when I put it into x plus 3, I get positive. x minus 1, I get positive, and x minus 4, I get negative. Multiply those all together, I get negative. And then finally, a number greater than 4, I'm going to use 5. When I sub those in, I get positive, positive, and positive. They're all positive. And so I get my answers. Here's my answers here. Let me circle them on here. When is it greater than 0? In here, when negative 3 is less than x, is less than 1. And here, when x is greater than 4, because I see right there in both of those sections, it came out to be positive. If you like the graphing method better, good. You will like the graphing method better in this chapter. Moving forward, it'll become uh, not as powerful. And there's the graph again, and the points I found. These points, these dots on here are just the points I found up here. So, for instance, um, I found out the point negative uh, 4, negative 40 up there. And so I put on the graph negative 4, negative 40 way down there. So those are just the points I subbed in there. And that's a much better graph because I had some points to work with but also I used a computer to generate it so you can get a perfect graph there. Some notes. Notice that at each zero, the, this polynomial changed signs. That does not have to happen. You don't have to see it change signs all the way through there. A double root will allow the graph to go up to the x-axis, but not cross and change signs. Uh, you may have to use the quadratic formula to find zeros. That could come up in, in the middle of all this. If you're forced into using the quadratic formula and get non-real answers, so like square roots of negatives, you just ignore those. You don't have to worry about them because they're not zeros. Uh, this example was already factored and set up with a zero on one side. Many won't be. And while this method will work when the inequality is linear, it is overkill. You could use this to do the stuff from yesterday, but it, it's just too much work. You don't have to do all this to solve linear inequalities. And there's some examples here. I'd like to make some room here. Just give me a second to move this down a little bit. On to the next page. So I have room to work here. Don't need that keyboard anymore. Two examples. Solve the following inequality. x to the power of 4 minus 8x. This one isn't factored, so I'm going to have to factor it first to do this. 
So I, I see a common factor. Watch out for common factors. So many questions that look really hard are actually really easy if you watch out for a common factor. And I get x bracket x cubed minus 8 less than 0. Uh, so how is this question different? It needs to be factored beforehand. Now look, this is difference of cubes. Difference of cubes comes up enough that you have to have these things memorized and you have to be able to see a difference of cubes is coming. So here I get x bracket x minus 2 is the first factor in this difference of cubes. And then I need an x squared. And then uh, back here is a plus 4. And then you have to think for a minute, what do I need for this middle term? And it's a negative 4x. Okay, uh, so that's all less than 0. Um, if you have trouble remembering the difference of cubes formula, um, to be honest, it's not something you have to have memorized. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake there. I need that uh, minus 2x. minus 2x. Plus 2x. Yeah, plus 2x is what makes it work. There we go. Um, so you have to have those steps memorized uh, when you're doing uh, different cubes. Now then, after I've got that part, I've got ready to set my zeros. Take a look at this thing, though. x squared plus 2x plus 4 doesn't factor, so I'm going to have to rely on the quadratic formula here. So, quadratic formula. Uh, I got, here's my zeros, uh, x equals 0, or x equals 2, or x equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I know some of you have calculators that actually do the quadratic formula. So let me show you the steps you need to show. You need to show you can do the quadratic formula and not rely on your calculator. Um, so uh, you got to show this step. Negative 2 plus or minus square root of 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 4 all over 2 times 1. And I get x equals negative 2 plus or minus square root 4 minus 16 is negative 12, so no real answers here. And when there's no real answers, we don't have to worry about those. We don't have to put those in as any zeros. There's only the two zeros, x equals 0 and x equals 2. Now I'm going to build the chart. If you want to do these with graphing, I'll do a little graph of it underneath in just a minute here, but I want you to see this chart and how to build it very carefully. So with zeros of 0 and 2, I want to look at this, I want to consider this function for x less than 0, so before I get to the first 0, and I want to look at this uh, graph between 0 and 2, and I want to look for greater than 2. Those are my three sections that I have to look at because I've got these dividing numbers of 0 and 2. And what I'm looking at is x bracket x minus 2, bracket x squared plus 2x plus 4. Those are the three factors. I still have to use the factor in there, but I don't have to um, use extra zeros from there. So here's my thinking. I'm going to use a number representing the section x less than 0. Any number less than 0 will work. So the simplest number I can think of that's less than 0, I'm going to use negative 1. If I put negative 1 in for x, I get negative if I put negative 1 into x minus 2, I get negative. And if I put negative 1 into that big quadratic thing, I get, uh, that just takes a second in my head, 1 minus 2 is negative 1 plus 4. That's positive. So in this section here, what I get is a positive number. When I multiply negative times negative times positive, I'll get positive. You see what I've got it with a big positive there. My thinking's underneath there, and my final answer is above there. If you didn't follow that, I understand. These tables are not... Uh, are a little bit difficult to understand how I'm getting those answers, but we'll use them so much, it's worth the investment here. Let's try it again. I want to look between the next two zeros. Between 0 and 2, I need a number between 0 and 2. I'm going to use the number 1 as my representative in that section, and I'm going to put 1 in for x, which is the first factor over here. So I got positive when I put it in there. When I put it into one minus, x minus 2, I get 1 minus 2, I get negative. And when I put it into this big quadratic, well, those are all positive, so it's going to come out to be positive. And I get negative in that section of the graph. Next, x greater than 2. When I put that in for x, I get positive. 
Oh, what number am I using? I'm going to use a 3. And when I put it into x minus 2, I get positive. And anything I put into this thing is going to be positive. So I get positive in that section. And I'm ready to answer the question. x to the 4th minus 8x, the original um, question, will be less than 0 when... Okay, which section here? I want less than 0, so I guess I want negative numbers. Right in there, that's where I want, what I'm looking for there. When 0 is less than x is less than 2. Now, if that was confusing, that's fine. Um, let those tables, uh, try them a little bit and sort of get used to them. You really need to have the gist of them before chapter 5 starts. But you can do all the chapter 4 questions without those, those, those things. You could, from right here... Um, right, the other way, from right here, you could go, okay, quick quick little sketch of a graph here. You don't even need a perfect graph. All you need is, okay, I've got a 0 at x equals 0. That's what I found is the 1, 0. And I've got a 0 at x equals 2. Oh, I'm going to do that one red. The other 0 at x equals 2. So I've used this information and this information. And uh, it's a degree 4 function, positive. So it's got to go something like this. And then through here. There might be other features in there, but that's the main parts of the features. There might be maxes and mins and so on. Maybe the shape over on uh, this side here, maybe it does something like that. Or I, I don't know what. Um, let me just undo that. I don't really know. This is the evidence I have. It's got to be degree 4. So it's got to be positive Going to positive infinity on both sides and through those two zeros. And that's all I need to answer the question. When is it negative? Right in there. And the answer is 0 less than x less than 2. Now, after I've done that whole thing, oh, full statement here. Therefore, x to the fourth minus 8x is less than 0 when 0 less than x less than 2. After seeing that full example, you might think, so as long as I can graph them, as long as I can do what I did last chapter, I can just answer inequalities? And the answer is yes. As long as you can graph what's there and use the skills from last chapter, you can do inequalities, no problem. But we do want to start learning these tables a little bit. Not for this chapter, for next chapter. Okay, one more example. This one, though, um, goes back to having something on both sides of the equation. And our methods of factoring do, are not suitable for something like this that has things on both sides like that. So we want to get a zero on both sides. So the first step of this is just to get everything to one side. So I get x cubed minus x squared minus 3x plus 3 uh, plus x cubed minus 2x minus 5. I've moved all those things over and they've changed signs. The negative x cubed became positive, the positive 2x became negative 2x, and the positive 5 became negative 5. I'm just going to collect like terms here. I see 2x cubed. Um, I don't see any other x squared, so I have minus x squared. And then I see a minus 5x and minus 2. And so now i got to factor this thing. So I go let p at x equal 2x cubed minus x squared minus 5x minus 2. This is hopefully something you're really good at by now. And then I sub in P at 1. When I sub that in, what do I get? 2 minus 1 is 1. Uh, minus 6 is minus 5. Minus 2. Wait, 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 uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. Minus 5 is negative 4. Oh, negative 6. Well, not 0. That's the important thing. You can plug in your calculator. I just sort of do them in my head to, to see if I can stay in practice. P at negative 1 equals, uh, let's see, that's going to be negative 2. Minus 1 is negative 3. Plus 5 is 5. Minus 2 is 0. Ooh, there we go. P at negative 1 is 0. Therefore, x plus 1 is a factor. So I'm going to use a k value of negative 1. Here's the coefficients. 2, negative 1, negative 5, and negative 2. Bring down the 2, multiply by negative 1. Add, multiply by negative 1. And add, multiply by negative 1. What's happening here? Let's back up a little bit. Multiply by negative 1 and add. Multiply by negative 1 and add. 
multiply by negative one and add. Made a little mistake there, but I knew I, it, that's the nice thing about this synthetic division. I knew it had to come out to zero. So, uh, so we have um, therefore um, x plus one. x plus 1 times 2x squared minus 3x minus 2 is greater than or equal to 0. And so x plus 1, we're going to do a little factoring here, a little grade 10, 11 factoring here. Maybe you've got your own little method for it. I just sort of think it through. I go, okay, well, it's going to be 2x squared. It's got to be 2x and x. Got to multiply to negative 2 these last two numbers, so I think I need a, a negative 2 over here and a 1 there. Let me just check 2x squared. Yep, negative 4x plus 1x, negative 3x. Negative. Okay, so I just multiply that out in my head to make sure it works. Beautiful. And here are my zeros. Therefore, x equals negative 1, or x equals negative a half, or x equals 2. Something like that. And then all I need is the graph here. If I want to answer these questions, you can practice with the tables if you want. I've shown an example of how to do that, but the, uh, tab the graph is a, is a fairly quick way to get these answers here. Uh, x equals 2. x equals negative 1. And x equals negative 1 half. And this is a degree 3 positive. How do I know that? Positive degree 3 right there. And so when I'm doing the rest of this graph, I'm just doing it in red, it's got to start positive infinity through there, through this one, through that one. Maybe it's not a perfect graph. It doesn't have to be. I just need the zeros and the shape to answer this question. The question is, when is this thing greater than or equal to zero? And it's greater than or equal to zero in this little section here. And it's greater than or equal to zero in this section here. And I'm ready to answer the question. And I like giving the full answer to the question. What they wanted to know was, when is x cubed minus x squared minus 3x plus 3, greater than or equal to negative x cubed plus 2x plus 5. And when is that true? Uh, between negative 1 and negative 1 half, and, between, and when x is greater than 4. Now, one little thing I hope you noticed in all this. 4, no, not 4. Two. Two was the other part. Um, one little thing. This asks for greater than or equal to. So these all have to be like that because I want it can be negative one is less than or equal to x. See, x can be zero here. So I've got to include those in my answer. Basically, basically, most times, whatever's there, you've got to use in your answer. If it's greater than or equal to, then you use equals in your in your in your answer. Whereas up here, notice it was less than in the question. So the, the answers here did not have those in there, okay? So you can practice and build the table here and see if you get the table um, this, with, that gives the same results. But basically, if you're confused at all by the table, do a few with graphs and then an experiment with the tables for this chapter. That's it for here, for this lesson here. Definitely try enough of these in the homework that you feel confident about them because this is a